Good evening, and welcome back to Neurodiversity News. I know it's been a long time. I've been on hiatus, actually. As you can see from my previous video with Aaron Piper, I got myself a new apartment and just doing my best to live independently. If you're autistic, I'm sure many of you will know that that could be very difficult. So I took a bit of a break from the videos besides the one with Aaron because we were just talking and discussing things. But I wanted to make another video for you guys. And this is going to be an ode to the high support needs people because while I focused on things like autism acceptance in the past, I never really went into detail about high support needs or non-speaking people. And I want to make this video to raise awareness of them and to give them visibility. That is in a good way. One that counteracts much of the narrative used against them, such as from Autism Speaks or the National Council on Severe Autism. And I wanted to shed the high support needs community in a positive light and I hope to do them justice and for those who are watching I hope I do you guys justice and when I talk about someone who is high support needs what I'm referring to is someone who needs more than likely 24 7 care such as to cook or to use the bathroom or or to shower or anything of that nature. Now, there are some people who do need help some of the time, but when I'm talking about high support needs people, they are people who need those kinds of things consistently. And based on a job I had as a direct support professional or DSP, I have myself experienced such people. Believe it or not, I've encountered some autistic activists who have no idea that such autistic people exist, but they do. And I think they deserve visibility. But that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them at all. I care about them very much, and I don't want a world where they don't exist. Because from what I've seen, there are studies out there trying to find ways to reverse autistic behavior or to detect it in the womb, which I'm sure I've mentioned in the past, but it's very scary. And to have a world without them would just be very dismal. It would take away diversity, neurodiversity. From this point onward, some of the things that I will be talking about might be a little triggering. So just keep that in mind and just watch the video when you're in better spirits. I'm going to go into a little anecdote from that job. So on my first day at the group home, there was a boy that I'll name Adam. He was a teenager, and he had very minimal speech. He spoke in echolalia, and we were getting his morning routine ready, which was to brush his teeth and to have breakfast. And when we were walking him to the bathroom, there were other kids in the group home who were jumping and, and yelling and such, and there was a lot of staff there, and it was very crowded and noisy and overwhelming even for me. So I can only imagine how it was for Adam. And once it got to a point, he suddenly just slammed the back of his head against the wall and dropped to the floor, punching himself in the head and yelling. And so I will just tell you, at first, it was terrifying. Not because... I felt that I would be hurt, but because I just felt really bad for him because of the pain he was going through. And and so what we did from there was we took him into his bedroom and I just stood outside like because I was in the training phase, not knowing what to do. And so he would say, say you're sorry to the lead DSP. And she would use a timer for seven minutes, blocking the doorway with a block pad, which is like a piece of foam that protects your body from getting punched because these clients were prone to aggression. And, and so after the timer went off and he was calm, we continued on with his day. 
And these are the types of things that I think people need to be aware of because they can happen. But what we need to do differently from Autism Speaks or the National Council on Severe Autism because they don't do these things out of malice or for no reason. They do it because they're overwhelmed and because they just feel like they have no other option because what's going on internally is so painful. With myself, I've even had meltdowns where I was self-injurious, even into adulthood, and it hurts. It sucks. But I think it would be much more effective to prevent any kind of stressful moments from happening rather than going inside the brain and trying to rewire our circuitry, basically, whether it be before, when, while, while we're in the womb or after we're born. There's either or, it's very unnatural. We need to do what we can to make the environment easier for them to live in. And it may be challenging, but it'll be worth it in the end. To me, a good society is one that takes care of its most vulnerable first. If I word anything the wrong way, please do tell me, and I will absorb your feedback and be transparent and do what I can do better. Now, Adam also had an intellectual disability, which psychiatry.org defines as any IQ score below 70 to 75. Now, there's a bit of a problem with the idea of IQ scores because it is not a very accurate reflection of one's intelligence, and it actually has a very dark history. And I'm going to be going into a little detail about it because it's rooted in eugenics, and I feel like awareness of that would be very necessary. I'll be reading an excerpt from DePaul University. Throughout the early 1900s, Eugenesis labored to devise objective methods of measuring and quantifying valued traits, including intelligence, in order to substantiate their hypothesis of Nordic genetic advantage. Some of their more preposterous experiments involved measuring the crania of schoolchildren, analyzing the facial asymmetry of criminals, and sketching the toes of prostitutes. Eugenesis struggled for years to produce compelling results until the advent of Alfred Binet's intelligence scale in 1909 gave rise to standardized intelligence testing, colloquially known as IQ testing. Armed with this so-called objective methodology, American eugenicists advance a straw man rationale for large-scale testing. They reason that society needed to identify, segregate, and sterilize the feeble-minded initially defined as those with mental disabilities, but later extended to include any unfit person of low intelligence, character, or ethnicity. In both Germany and the United States, persecution of the feeble-minded hastened a broader eugenic campaign against immigration, miscegenation, and other professed threats to Nordic ascendancy. The fact that IQ tests are even used today is beyond me because I remember when I was about six or seven years old, they were evaluating me for mental health and were checking my IQ. And I apparently had a very low score, mostly because I just did not want to be there and had no clue why I was there to begin with and didn't know why I was being tested for so many things. And so later when I did it as an adult, I got around a hundred something on it. So I don't think it's a very accurate representation because it can fluctuate throughout your lifespan depending on different factors. And so it appears rather flawed. Now we need to ask ourselves the question, what does an IQ score even prove anyway? What does one get out of it? Does it prove to people how worthy you are? And that is, worthy of what exactly? Because everyone deserves to live regardless of their, of their intelligence level. And they should be entitled to a happy life, especially disabled people. How high support needs people are framed in the media, especially, is very important. 
you've already seen my review of the film Music by Sia, which was an absolute train wreck, as I'm sure anybody in the know would know. But there's also a rather obscure video that was made in collaboration with the National Council on Severe Autism called A Voice for Severe Autism. And it is probably one of the most distressing videos I've ever seen in my life. And I thought about including a clip, but I don't even think I should because I think it would give anyone nightmares. It shows high support needs people engaging in self-injurious behaviors with the narrator talking over it and parents inserting their anecdotes. And the narrator starts by saying, we face a growing public health crisis in America. The number of individuals with severe autism is on the rise. And I don't really know what to think of that because for one, severe autism is a bit of a demeaning term because whenever I hear it at least, someone describing severe autism is describing how severely it affects the family, not so much how it affects the actual autistic person, because a lot of the time those autistics can be aggressive for one reason or another, usually because of distress, their needs not being met, not being listened to, and things of that nature. And I think the crisis here is the fact that these families are not getting support, which I am in full support of. But when research comes into question, that's when it can become scary because things could very easily go wrong, such as, as I have already discussed in my eugenics video, talking about finding the gene for autism and finding ways to prevent the baby from being born, like what happened with people with Down syndrome, like in Iceland, between 2008 and 2012, 100% of those babies were aborted. And so that would happen to the autistic people too, if they found a gene to see how severe they come out. And I want to find a way for these autistic people to live without having to resort to selective abortion based on desirable or undesirable behaviors. Also, the phrase on the rise implies that that something horrible is coming, as if the existence of these people coming into the world is a bad thing. Because a lot of frustration can stem from not being able to communicate, there are alternatives. Of course, iPads are nothing new, but one thing that many people tend to denounce is spelling to communicate and facilitate communication. Now, those methods have been very effective for the people who use it. And I'm going to be including a clip of someone using spelling to communicate and how it helped them. Gregory, would you want to go to space? The miracle came in the form of a woman with long blonde hair and a belief in people with autism. With her pencil and stencil board, she was able to unlock years of silence, like she was waving a magic wand. Uh-huh. 
keep going. Y, my, W, O, R, L, D, my world. Hold on. No thanks. The boy's mom cried tears of joy. Oh my right. god! And two. H E R. Gregory, are you kidding me? You're kidding me, Gregory. From that moment on, things were different. The mom and dad talked to him like an adult. He could make decisions for himself and through lots of hard work, he got better and better on his letter board. It was the best time in his life. Something changed within the boy, and he realized he wanted everyone to know how smart people with autism are. So with the help of his mother and father, he began to do just that. He began a blog. He wrote several books. He participated in book clubs and social groups. He sat on panels for various webinars and conferences. He joined a group of other non-speakers who were brainstorming ideas to get the letter board used in schools. He was interviewed for research studies and podcasts. He wrote poetry and short stories and he showed people his letter board sessions. Anything to show the intellect and capability of the autistic mind and their ability to decide their own future. It is a lofty goal, but a necessary one. Now see, he may not be able to speak, but that's not the end of the world. And he found a way. And a lot of people got found their way of communication by starting with the letter board. DJ Savarese is one example of someone who started with a letter board and he got very far in life and people really underestimated both of these guys' intelligences and it's a shame. They deserve so much better and I'm glad they now are able to access the things they were not able to access before. Now pointing on a letter board may take a little time, but there's nothing wrong with waiting and being a little patient. At the end of the day, if autistic people are expected to be patient with neurotypicals, then I think we should expect the same for neurotypicals to be patient with us. You know what I mean? I wanted to show you what autism means from the perspective of a non-speaker, that is Kit Audie, who has made a few really awesome videos and I really like them a lot. And I figured they give you a very good idea of what it means to be on non-speaking. Hello, folks. I am Kit, and today I want to answer a question. What is autism? First, I want to say that autism is a disability. Some people do not want to call it that, but I will explain why I do. One reason people may not want to call autism a disability is because disabilities are viewed negatively and stigmatized. To avoid that, they might use words like differently abled, diverse abled, or superpower. But the way I see it, that only adds to stigma. If we treat disability like a bad word or an insult and move to using a different word, the stigma doesn't go away. We are just running from it. I like to be direct and I do not like euphemisms, so I just say disabled if I mean disabled. Not different or special or slow or diverse ability. Disabled. Being disabled is also a source of empowerment to me because it means I am part of a much larger community with a long history of advocating for our rights. We are more powerful together and excluding myself from the community because I am not visibly or severely or inherently disabled enough doesn't do me any good. 
Maybe one day society will be so accommodating that autism and some other conditions won't cause enough struggle to be disabling, but that is not the current reality. Honestly, I don't think autism will ever not be a disability, but that doesn't really matter because for now it is. For now, I and others like me benefit from and need the services, rights, and legal benefits that are afforded to disabled people. If we reject the idea or label of disability, we also lose our grounds to ask for differential treatment. And we need the differential treatment. I love the way that they were explaining it, because they were framing it as disability is not a bad word. It is just the way that we are and the way that we live. And it's natural, and that's okay. And that needs to be the new dominant attitude about autism in that, sure, there can be challenges, but it's not the end of the world. Since they mentioned Mel Bags in the video, I feel like I could not talk about non-speakers if I didn't include Mel Bags. So I'm going to be including a video clip of theirs called In My Language. In this part of the video, the water doesn't symbolize anything. I am just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Far from being purposeless, the way that I move is in a going response to what is around me. Ironically, the way that I move when responding to everything around me is described as being in a world of my own, whereas if I interact with a much more limited set of responses and only react to a much more limited part of my surroundings, people claim that I am opening up to true interaction with the world. They judge my existence, awareness and personhood on which of a tiny and limited part of the world I appear to be reacting to. The way I naturally think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all, but it is a way of thinking in its own right. However the thinking of people like me is only taken seriously if we learn your language, no matter how we previously thought or interacted. As you heard, I pan sing along to what is around me. It is only when I type something in your language that you refer to me as having communication. Mel Bags died on April 11th, 2020. And I really love this video because it shows how autistic people need to be taken seriously and acknowledged and listened to, even if we don't always communicate in the way that non-autistic people want us to. And our voices, especially non-speaking voices, matter just as much as non-disabled people. Finally, I'm going to show you a clip from the short film Listen by Communication First. The video was made by non-speakers, and it really drives the point home as to why non-speakers need to be acknowledged and listened to. Hi, I am Grant Blasco, a college-bound high school senior. My name is Jordan Zimmerman. I communicate by typing on an iPad. My name is Endeavor, and I'm a multimodal communicator. Hi, I'm Isaiah Graywall from Canada. I type and spell to communicate. We're all autistic, and we're unable to rely on speech to be understood. Most of us are non-speaking. Some of us can speak a little, or from time to time. People have a lot to say about us. They write stories and biographies. They produce plays and make movies about us. But they are not listening to us. Just because I cannot speak does not mean I don't hear. I hear everything people say to me or about me. I may not show understanding in my face, but I know and understand. Not a word said escapes my so strong ears. We may be non-speaking and need help with many things, but that doesn't mean we can't contribute to a book, a play, or a movie. If you always leave us out, people think we are not able to participate. That's why most people don't realize that we have a contribution to make. Include us, and you will see that we have so much to give. To anyone who wishes to represent non-speaking people, I ask that you communicate with us directly. 
honest representation of non-speaking people leaves us more vulnerable to abuse. I should not be left out of conversations or presumed incompetent, simply because I don't rely on spoken language. There needs to be more representation of diverse autistic identities. The media often shapes how we view ourselves and how others around us view and esteem our place in society. When there is lack of representation or improper representation, it directly feeds into the internalization of stigma, where your membership in a group is the very cause of your negative self-esteem, feelings of inferiority and even feelings of self-hatred. If your story says there's no hope, people may not realize how many of us can share solutions about how to support non-speaking children and adults. People who write about us tell the world what they think is best. Other people who follow their example could hurt us rather than help us. To be treated like a child just because you can't communicate in the usual ways is humiliating and traumatic. The way to demean me is to speak to me as if I am a baby. I don't like people talking about me like I am not there. How do we get it right? Consult non-speaking autists from the start and at key points throughout your project. Read our blogs and books. Watch our movies and videos. Learn about our lives. If you have a voice, you can use it to help bring dignity back for the members of the more marginalized autistics. Let's change the plot lines and the narratives around non-speaking autistics so more and more are allowed to be visible in society and avail of opportunities in all kinds of areas. Then we will truly see more and more non-speaking autistic actors who will be able to provide us with more positive and authentic representations. Ask us. Listen to us. Nothing about us without us. This video, as well as all the others I included, I think should be watched in full in order to get the full effect of the message behind them. They put in a lot of work to release that video. It actually came out right around the time of when Sia's music came out to kind of set the record straight about non-speaking autistic people not being listened to. And this is a great example of non-speakers standing up for themselves. Of course, there are some who are just not able to do that because of intellectual disability, but they will need their families to to represent them as well as us. We want to do what we can to advocate for your children too and to do right by them and make sure they get the help they need. That is like supports in the home and such, not to change their brain wiring and such. So the parents watching are probably wondering, what's next? Well, what's next is you could share these videos with others and to get the word out about them and hopefully change the narrative surrounding autism because too often in the mainstream we see like tragedy narratives or that autistic people are like a burden, which is wrong. And we need to show that even if autistic people need help, that that's okay. And that you have to be a little selfless, which is a good thing because we live in a very hyper individualistic capitalist society that has completely eliminated the idea of interdependence or made it seem like it's shameful to need help from your parents. I'm here to tell you that that's terrible because I myself personally was kicked out of my parents' home and exiled by them because I needed a little help and I do what I can to live on my own, but it's not easy. And they didn't give me autonomy for while I was living at their home, and that's wrong. Even if they live with you, if they're an adult and they are able to consent, you need to give them autonomy. Even when they're younger, if they're like a child or a teenager and they don't want to do something, let that happen. Just don't force things on them. Don't force them into things. Of course, for something like brushing your teeth and bathing, those are very necessary things. And while being forceful about it is not good, just slowly integrating them into it is very helpful and being very kind about it and very compassionate 
at every step is really good. And also, we have to do away with behaviorism. I already went into detail about that in some previous videos of mine that you could check out and get a better idea of how bad ABA and behaviorism is. Another thing you can do is to give them greater access to communication, such as the letter board, spelling and communicate that you saw earlier, or the rapid prompt method. I will be putting resources about all those things down below. For those who have the time and are able, parents, I recommend you all confront your legislators and fight for increased Medicaid and to get direct support professionals in the home rather than having to send them into a group home miles and miles away. Increase the funding, get better incentives for employees to want to be hired as a direct support professional. Make sure they get benefits. The more vocal you become and the more relentless you are, the easier it will be to get what you want. I see so many parents fighting so hard to try to find cures and such. That energy could so easily be redirected into getting better services without requiring a cure or to take away the child's autism because it's diversity. It's a core part of who we are and our identity. And that goes for both of those who need 24 seven care or people like me who have it a little bit easier. And then again, that's a little bit of an arbitrary statement because I have a lot of difficulties in life, like keeping relationships and self-injury once in a while and things of that nature. I wouldn't really blame autism for that, though, because we have been conditioned for so long to believe that only one way is the correct way, and that's not correct. There are so many different ways of functioning and living, and we need to become a much more inclusive society. And to get there, that will require a change in attitude and a change in narrative and the way that we frame things, as I said before. You don't have to look at autism as a tragedy. You could look at it in a positive light if you so choose. Of course, to the autistic people out there, there are those who do view it negatively and your views are valid, but my take is just a little bit different because I feel like just for our mental health, for both ourselves and for our parents, it's better to just look at the glass half full if that makes sense. For the autistic people watching, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself if you are able. And if you're not, find whatever way possible that you can. Get people to listen to you. Don't hold back in what you need to say. And be honest and tell it like it is. And for the parents, I urge you to be as vocal as possible, whether it be to fellow parents or to politicians or whoever. Be that parent that other parents may or may not be turned off by. Be the one that your child sees as a hero. Someone who can meet their child where they're at and to love and to embrace them for who they are and to accept every fiber of their being from the good to the bad, from the peaceful to the not so peaceful. Because if you show your child direct love and to show them that the way they are is okay, that there may be challenges, but it's not the end of the world, your child will see that. Trust me on that. Another thing I want to mention is that there are a lot of parents who go on social media talking about their high support needs kids as private moments. Stop it. Just stop it. Because it's really exploitative and harmful to the child by talking about them in their most vulnerable moments, such as fe smearing feces on the wall or banging their heads against the wall. Because that's nobody's business. And autistic people never choose to do those things. And 
it makes autistic people look like monsters or like they're beyond salvation and need to be fixed. And it's just not right. Because what if, like, what if your child grows up and sees that their parent told thousands of strangers online about an embarrassing moment they had? If you were in their shoes, would you enjoy that at all? Would that not put you in distress? Knowing that your most private moments have been shared to everyone and now the whole world knows? Just think about it. Put yourself in their shoes. And if you don't want people exposing your private moments online, then don't do it to them. Don't have a double standard. Treat them in the way that you would want to be treated. Think of it that way. This may have turned out longer than I expected, but I hope you all enjoyed it, and I do thank you for watching. I'll do what I can to release more videos in the future, but I can't make any promises because with the COVID-19 pandemic and trying to live independently, it can be a little difficult to have this gather the spoons together. So I appreciate all your support, and I hope that you all learned something of value here today. And I hope you all have a great day.